OK. Donc, ça enregistre. Alors, euh, je vais juste commencer par dire un petit mot de bienvenue. Euh, bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'être parmi nous aujourd'hui. Euh, moi, je m'appelle Sophie. Je suis représentante pour le Comité de santé mondiale du FMSA Québec pour l'Université de Montréal en Mauricie. Euh, donc, aujourd'hui, on est vraiment fiers de vous apporter cette conférence en ligne sur le verdissement des hôpitaux. Euh, je vais commencer par vous présenter notre conférencier, euh, Dr Zibi, qui est un médecin de famille spécialisé en soins palliatifs, qui est aussi cofondateur de Synergie Santé Environnement, euh, un organisme qui travaille de concert avec plusieurs euh, institutions dans le but de les aider à mettre en place des actions éco-responsables. Je vais, laisser, je vais laisser nous en dire un peu plus sur lui-même et son parcours au cours de la conférence. Euh, juste avant qu'on commence, j'aimerais vous rappeler quelques petites informations. Euh, la conférence devrait durer entre une et deux heures. Euh, merci de garder vos, vos micros fermés euh, pour limiter les bruits de fond. Euh, en ce qui concerne les questions, vous allez pouvoir les écrire euh, en tout moment dans le chat, puis nous, on va s'occuper euh, de les poser à Dr Zibi. Euh, la conférence va se tenir en anglais, mais euh, Dr Zibi parle très bien français aussi, donc euh, n'hésitez pas à poser vos questions en français aussi. Euh, on vous remercie encore une fois pour votre présence, puis on espère que vous allez apprécier la présentation. Euh, pour euh, Tout de suite, je vais, je vais céder la parole à Chloé, qui va vous faire une petite traduction en anglais. Moi qui vais la faire. <laughs> Julia, pardon, pardon. <laughs> uh, so, um, hi everyone. I'll just uh, translate very quickly what Sophie just said. So, my name is Julia and I'm um, also a, a local officer in the Global Health Committee for EFMSA Québec uh, in Trois-Rivières. So, uh, thank you all for being here. We're super proud to uh, present you today with uh, this webinar on how to make our hospitals greener. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Zigbee will be our speaker today, and he is a family doctor um, and also co-founder of Synergie Santé Environnement, which is a non-profit organization uh, which works, uh, works with different um, businesses in Quebec in order to help them improve uh, their environmental impact uh, here. Uh, so, I'll let him uh, tell you a bit more about himself and his uh, non-profit. And uh, just so before we start, a few reminders. Uh, please uh, turn off your mics so we don't hear any uh, feedback uh, noises. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat. And uh, me and Sophia will read them uh, throughout the presentation. And the, the questions can be, can be in French or English. Don't worry about it. Uh, Dr. Zippy also speaks French, so uh, don't hesitate if it's in French. Uh, so yeah, I hope you all enjoy uh, the webinar and thank, uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, the webinar should last about an hour or two. So uh, thank you. Thank you both uh, Sophie and uh, Julia. Um, I'm really proud to be here presenting uh, for the IFFM, uh, IFMSA again. Um, it seems like every time you guys invite me to come and talk, uh, there's so much more to talk about. And so uh, things are moving very, very quickly on the ground. So first, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a family physician by training. And uh, currently, I'm the um, head of palliative care at the Jewish General Hospital. And um, I'm, my passion uh, is in care for the environment and uh, the environmental impact of the healthcare system, as well as palliative care. And uh, a lot of people ask me sort of how do, how, how do we meld the two? And, and it's really about respecting the life cycle and, and seeing what are the foundations of our health and how to stay honest about the importance of all the different parts of our life, uh, which is what attracted me to family medicine and what equally attracts me to palliative care. Um, the reason that uh, I became an expert in this field of uh, ecosystem and um, environmental impacts of the healthcare system is because I saw a huge void when I first started practicing medicine. And um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what that void has been filled with uh, over the years. Um, but much like you, I went through medical school wondering, huh? We're hearing a lot of in, in the news about uh, environmental degradation, about the fact that climate change is uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest determinant of our future health uh, and is impacting our health already today in, a, in very uh, sizable ways. So how is it that our healthcare system and our health education system doesn't seem to talk about it quite so much? 
Well, let's get started and uh, we'll, we'll walk through a few of these facts and ideas together. So what we'll do is I'll start with the, the slide share. Can you guys see the, the first slide? All right, so um, like uh, Sophie uh, and Julia said, um, when I first started practicing medicine uh, as a very young doc, um, one of the first things that struck me was how much waste was generated around myself and, um, and how much all of my techniques with my patients was generating a huge amount of waste, both in the hospitals uh, as well as in my clinic. So I was trained um, as a, an obstetrical family physician. So I was doing a lot of deliveries um, as well as um, helping a lot of individuals near the end of their lives. And in both of those situations, people had generated enormous amounts of waste. Um, as well in my family medicine clinic, there was a significant amount of waste there. And I began asking questions as a young doc about, well, you know, how much waste are we generating? And has anyone been looking at that? Well, that was around the turn of the, the, turn of the millennia, in fact. And um, at that time, we had um, a significant amount of reports that were coming out, looking at really the way in which um, our ecosystems uh, were actually impacting uh, the determinants of our health. And this was the first time that we had a very sizable quantitative description of our ecosystems and their ecosystem services uh, and the impacts on our health. And I felt that it, it was uh, really important that my colleagues um, understood that these reports were coming out. And as I was looking around me in my immediate circle, it really didn't seem like there was anybody who was that interested in uh, what I was saying. And so I reached out a little bit further uh, around Canada and around the world and found that I certainly wasn't the only doctor that was thinking about it. Um, and that uh, we had, I had friends in many different places. But first of all, a couple uh, housekeeping pieces that I forgot to, to say. Number one, um, in terms of disclosure, I uh, am an advocate on environmental health issues at all levels of government, municipal, uh, federal and provincial. And uh, secondly, I don't get uh, significant um, remuneration for the work that I do in this field. Uh, even as the president of Synergie Santé Environnement, uh, I don't get any financial uh, remuneration for that. It's a completely volunteer position. Um, my learning goals for you guys today is to sensitize yourselves to the amplitude of the environmental damage due to healthcare, which is something which uh, we've managed to quantify much more significantly over the last several decades and to describe a little bit how um, the hospitalist and any physician, in fact, can really make a huge difference uh, in this process and, uh, and to try to empower you guys and to hopefully guide you through the process of becoming advocates on reducing the environmental impact of your healthcare system, as well as other uh, elements in your, in your society. So as we were talking about the um, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, uh, came out with reports on ecosystems and human well-being around the turn of the millennia. And um, simultaneously, the, uh, philosophers uh, around the world were beginning to begin to re-examine the tenets in which um, we were really uh, basing our societies on and saying, you know, quite frankly, uh, like Herschel Elliott stated, is that, you know, you, you can't have a really acceptable system of ethics uh, if it's destroying the ecosystems on which everything is dependent upon. So when you look upon um, your system of ethics that you're practicing in, don't we have to have a model which actually guarantees that we're not committing suicide? So this is something which I felt was uh, rang very uh, much to my heart. And I felt that uh, it really uh, encapsulated what it was that I felt was wrong here is that here we're going about in our healthcare system trying to help people. 
claiming to try to heal people while at the same time not taking into account all the different ways in which our healthcare system may actually be undermining their health, whether it be socially, uh, whether it be economically, and whether it be environmentally. And so when Herschel Elliott uh, summed it up so cleanly, uh, I was very, very happy and uh, began using exactly this kind of terminology when I was speaking to my colleagues. So who were these colleagues that I found uh, around Canada uh, about 20 years ago? Well, there was a very small group of doctors called the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, who, which was founded in the mid-1990s based upon exactly these ideas that we can't just keep going around uh, as if environmental degradation is not going to undermine our health. Uh, and they picked you know, very small causes at the time, like pesticide exposures, uh, for example, and, um, and they went about trying to make local change. Uh, and I reached out to them, and one of the things that they had done quite early on is they established a conference on um, the environmental impact of the healthcare system with several other organizations, which led to uh, the creation of a new organization called uh, the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. And at that same time, new tools were being developed uh, out of BC for how to measure in different ways the environmental impacts that, that individuals, communities, and institutions had. And one of those tools uh, was developed by um, uh, Mathis Wackernagel and William Reese, um, two researchers out of the University of BC. Uh, and a young physician decided to test these new, uh, this new tool called the ecological footprint. So what was the ecological footprint? The ecological footprint was if you try to take into account how much land geographically is necessary in area to both produce all of the materials in which you are using, uh, that you are consuming, uh, that you're needing to build things with, and necessary to capture all the waste and reabsorb and detoxify all the waste that you are actually producing. Well, we can quantify that and we can call that the ecological footprint and we can start giving a size uh, of the impact that your institution or yourself may have in terms of the, si the space that nature needs to occupy in order to make up for what you're consuming. So we call that the ecological footprint and Dr. Susan Germain, a young physician at the time, um, working out of Lionsgate Hospital, one of the top hospitals uh, in Southern BC, decided to work with her administration and with the uh, information which she had available to look at how large an area was necessary to actually furnish the hospital with all of the materials which it was using, as well as uh, how much area was necessary to absorb all the waste it was generating. So what she uh, concluded with what she estimated to be about 75% of the information she needed was that the total ecological footprint uh, of the Lionsgate Hospital was, about, was found to be about 2,841 hectares, or about five hectares per patient year, which corresponds to a land area of about 719 times larger than the actual area of four hectares. So, that's a really, really important lesson that came out of um, that uh, study, was that we have had for the first time indications that, you know, measurable indications of how much hospitals were really consuming in a, in a manner which uh, what meant something to people. So in 2006, an, uh, an entire uh, healthcare institutions, um, the London Health Science Center, which is a conglomerate of multiple uh, medical institutions, but in particular three hospitals in London, Ontario, decided to repeat this exercise with much more robust data. So now it was not the uh, physician which was initiating this as a research project. This was now the administration, which had a lot more data. Um, which they had accumulated, and, and they were uh, already committed to um, trying to reduce their environmental impacts already. So they were in the process of reducing their energy consumption, reducing their waste, trying to change their transportation. And they decided in the middle of this to say, you know what, we have to quantify this in a way which is meaningful for people. And so they um, 
took on uh, Reese and Wackernagel's um, model and in fact measured the environmental footprint of their three hospitals. As you can see, I'm circling in, these are the three hospitals in red. And the city limits are, is the borders which, uh, of this map, which you guys can see all around. So if you look at the hospital, that is the geographic space, the uh, area which is actually taken up by those hospitals. And when they finished their calculation of the ecological footprint, uh, it gave them this result. So L London, Ontario city proper is the center sort of blue gray area. And the amount of uh, area which um, was consumed by their, um, their hospitals was essentially if you if you take um, you know a square kilometer as being um, you know 100 hectares or a thousand hectares I can't exactly remember what the conversion is but it's you know many hundreds of times um, the actual area so the whole white bar around the the um, the edge of the uh, photo here is the actual area which is necessary in order to produce or uh, absorb um, the products and the waste which are generated by those hospitals. So an absolutely massive area is necessary to, uh, to continue maintaining the functioning of our hospitals. So 1,200 square kilometers compared to 32 hectares. So, with their rich data, they were also able to break down how, what were the major uh, elements that um, consumed the, um, that made up their ecological footprint. So one of the major uh, elements that they um, took about a third of their uh, ecological footprint was uh, consumed by utilities. So that means the electricity uh, that was needed to generate um, the power for the institution and the heating for the institution, as well as the hot water for the institution, uh, took up enormous amounts of uh, environmental resources in order to produce. So in order to mine the coal at the time, um, in order to um, you know, mine up the uranium at the time, in order to uh, produce the hydroelectric dams at the time, in order to um, you know, absorb all of the waste which is caused by those facilities, it created an enormous uh, proportion of their environmental impacts. And that demonstrated the importance of hospitals to become energy efficient um, in order to reduce the environmental impact of these extremely toxic or potentially toxic um, methods of extracting energy from our environment. The other element which uh, came out was um, the importance of capital items. So none of these may seem as, um, as surprises to you, but uh, at the time, it wasn't very clear whether it was really the, um, the disposables which was causing the majority of the environmental impact or was it the big items? Was it what was being generated all the way throughout the year and thrown away throughout the year or was it really the, um, the, the big buys, the objects which were um, you know, making up the, the bulk of the uh, reusable technology inside the hospital centers, uh, like your CT scanners, your MRI scanners, uh, your, your, your heating and ventilation systems, all these things that are gonna be there for a long period of time we call capital items. And what they discovered was that in fact, uh, it seemed like uh, the capital items were much more important than the short life materials and waste, which you see here in light green. So the thing that drives all of us doctors crazy and that we see on a day-to-day -day basis is all the disposable materials that we're using. But it seemed like in terms of the ecological footprint of the, of the, the hospital, that it turned out to be about 10% of the full env uh, environmental impact that they were using. But that it seemed much more important to look at those big ticket items that were being purchased and to see how we could work with the actual producers to reduce the environmental impact of their construction and their disposal. So these two elements together, utilities and, and uh, capital items, were proven in this study to be the, the big chunk 
of the work that was necessary for hospitals to try to reduce their environmental impacts. Why is that important? Well, because looking at the, um, the smaller material, short life materials and waste is a much more nitpicky detail, thousand product exercise. Whereas looking at the capital items and your utilities is actually taking it, you only have to deal with a much smaller number of uh, elements that you have to modify in order to make a much larger impact. So this was very good news to a lot of people because instead of having to retrain all of your uh, physicians, nurses, PABs, technicians on how to use new products uh, in their day-to-day -day activities, we could work with the much smaller teams of purchasing and put into place green purchasing criteria for the large ticket items and actually have a much bigger impact with much fewer people involved in the process. In other words, a lot of the environmental impact of your hospitals did not need physician, nurses, and, and uh, the frontline workers involved in them at all. And that was great news because we all know how stressed out uh, healthcare workers are and how uh, challenging it can be sometimes to bring them on board, doctors being some of the worst. So, um, What's very important is that while these uh, healthcare institutions were being sensitized individually to the fact that they were making a massive impact on the healthcare system, slowly but surely the World Health Organization and, uh, and other health organizations came on board and said that you know, climate change is not just an environmental issue. And with the help of many uh, health advocates around the world, including many um, medical students from Quebec, um, they actually went to the, um, the, the COPS, so the, the coalition of parties, in order to um, advocate for climate change being looked at as a health issue, not an environmental issue. Essentially, it's a social justice and health issue and that it's not just one thing, climate change, but it's a complete context. And that until we start realizing that climate change is not an element in and of itself, but a byproduct of a whole systemic issue based upon inequality, based upon lack of respect, based upon you know, sometimes very conscious neglect, um, we were not going to be able to tackle the most important issue of our lifetimes. And it really is a giant accelerator um, for the way in which we were already degrading um, the environment for decades before. So climate is kind of the way in which our bad stewardship of the environment is coming back to bite us in the butt faster than all the rest. And what is the healthcare system's responsibility with respect to that? The healthcare system, uh, the sector contributes to, to the global climate crisis um, a very significant proportion. And uh, it's been quantified in various different um, countries differently. But uh, globally, we are estimating somewhere between 4 and 5% of the environmental um, climate uh, footprint to be responsible by uh, healthcare, the healthcare sector. And it's important to realize that um, climate change and this real accelerator um, of environmental degradation that uh, that we've put into uh, in, in, that we've um, unleashed upon ourselves uh, is really going to be the bigger issue, much bigger than the coronavirus pandemic. Not that pandemics are not a very challenging thing that we all have to deal with. And let me tell you, they're taking up an enormous amount of my time right now. Um, it seems like everything that I'm doing really uh, at the moment as director of palliative care in my hospital is really in response to uh, the pandemic urgency. And that's not to say that it shouldn't be. But in the back of our minds, we have to absolutely make all of the changes that we're doing with the idea that they have to be climate appropriate. In other words, we can't be forgetting that the bigger picture is that we are degrading the undermining 
uh, and undermining the environmental determinants of our health while we're using our system this way. And uh, the UN Secretary General just really recently came out to say that quite explicitly, to say that while the entire world is reeling from uh, the coronavirus pandemic, and we'll talk about that, I'll be very happy to answer questions about how we deal with the coronavirus pandemic and the lessons that we're learning from it and how we can uh, attribute those lessons to the climate crisis. Um, it's many times greater than the coronavirus pandemic and that we absolutely have to keep our eye on the prize, which is uh, creating proper stewardship uh, for our, our planet. So this brings me to uh, another analysis of sort of what are some of the calculations of the health uh, impacts of our um, healthcare system. Now that we talked about the environmental impacts, uh, has anyone actually tried to assess how that translates into direct health outcomes? And so, uh, one of the leaders in this field, um, uh, Dr. Eckelman um, and his colleagues, has done that for multiple uh, countries, including Canada and the U.S. And looking at life cycle environmental emissions and health damages from the uh, Canadian healthcare system using uh, a novel economic, environmental, and epidemiological analysis, he put together sort of the economic inputs and outputs uh, of the healthcare system and estimated the amount of pollution that was caused through that. And then taking a look at the epidemiological evidence for what is um, caused in terms of health outcomes went from that kind of pollution. Um, he created very um, robust analyses and models for how exactly this impacts us. So in terms of um, looking at things, the, the most rigorous and important elements were greenhouse gases and other pollutant emissions that were generated by the healthcare industries. Um, and of course, modeling that together, uh, because we have the most um, direct evidence for the impacts of particularly air pollution. So he looked a lot at the air pollution effects primarily, along with some of the top um, chemical pollutants that were discharged from the Canadian healthcare system, and estimated um, that about 33 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions and over 200,000 tons of other pollutant emissions were produced by the, the Canadian healthcare industry yearly. And that translated uh, into about uh, 23,000 disability adjusted life years lost every year. So that's very, very significant. And if we compare that in other countries where uh, they, they keep track of uh, data points such as the, the number of uh, fatalities uh, or disability adjusted life years um, secondary to medical errors, for example, we found in the United States, at least, that um, the using a similar model, but with much more robust data, because the um, United States actually um, forces their uh, healthcare institutions to um, keep track of more data than the Canadian healthcare system does, that we are actually creating um, a burden of, uh, of health impacts, which is probably uh, comparable to the number of deaths which is caused by medical errors in hospitals every year. So on one hand, we know that our healthcare system harms people by the errors that we make, and that uh, in the um, in the American system, between you know forty five and one hundred thousand people die every year secondary to medical preventable errors, which is a huge number if you think about it. In Canada, it's probably around a tenth of that, right? We're about a tenth of the population. Or if you assume that our uh, healthcare system uh, is uh, better than them in terms of medical errors, and that's probably safe to say because of the fact that we tend to be a slightly less consumeristic model of healthcare, and therefore we're less likely to actually do unnecessary procedures on our patients and therefore cause less medical errors in that way. We may actually be less than 10%, but maybe let's say around 5%, which again puts us in the realm of around 20,000 people um, or 10,000 people who, uh, uh, sorry, if we're looking at around 10%, yeah, around 10,000 people who may be dying secondary to the, um, the waste and pollution which we're, 
which we are actually producing. So that's relatively conservative because of the fact that he only took into account several factors which we have pretty robust data in terms of the um, the um, burden of, of health impact uh, on our society. But these are two studies which um, I recommend that people familiarize themselves with because they're quite useful for bringing up the direct burdens onto the, uh, of health in our society, secondary to the pollution which is caused by our healthcare systems. So that brings us back to, okay, so what do we do about it, Dr. Zegby? So you're telling me all of this information. How useful is that if you can't do anything? So that's kind of the way I felt um, when I was a starting physician. So I took a bit of, and it made me very depressed in all fairness. I mean, even 20 years ago, uh, it was clear to me, we were talking about climate change 20 years ago, and we were talking about environmental de degradation when I was a kid. And I'm like, we're still not doing th anything about it. And here the physicians are looked at as if they are the health leaders in our society and they're not doing much about it. So I got actually very depressed because it looked to me as if we were just sort of, you know, um, fiddling on the Titanic. And so I took a break from my studies, uh, from my work actually at the time, and decided to start a small project just looking at the, you know, the waste generated in our local CLSC at the CLSC Côte des in Montreal. And with a small grant from uh, Récit Québec at the time, we just managed to, you know, generate a report uh, of how much waste was being generated by just collecting all the garbage over a period of two weeks and just going through it all. So we had the help of an environmental company at the time, and we, they just went through all of our garbage and produced a report of exactly what it was that we were consuming. At the time, we weren't allowed to look at our biomedical waste, but we were able to generate that, you know, we were producing as a small CLSC upwards of around 200 tons of waste. So that was very significant. And more importantly, a lot of that waste was already able to be recycled and reused. So the city was ready to take all that waste away and actually try to put some of it to good use in recycling or reuse, but we just weren't making the effort. So based upon that report, um, that was sort of the foundation for um, us taking this to the next level and, and speaking to the, the provincial governments and speaking to the local governments uh, of how we can start making an impact here. So having a very supportive administration at the time, we were able to further this work and demonstrate a, a, a bunch of pilot projects in our own um, CLSC at the time. So at the beginning of the 2000s, we were having electric bikes uh, available for our home care nurses. Um, we had uh, miniature garbage cans installed with, uh, beside large recycling bins in, in all of our offices. And we had uh, multiple projects for um, looking at how to substitute reusable items from recyclable ones. We learned a lot of lessons in, those, in the, those early years. Number one being that everything eventually is thrown out. Um, and that if you don't create a circular economy uh, in that um, those objects that are thrown out, even the ones that you think are reusable, uh, all of them eventually disappear. We learned a, a very uh, hard lesson when we tried to prove that our metal specula for vaginal exams um, would be much better for the environment than our plastic ones that were disposable. What we discovered was that our metal specula, which we thought were lasting for many, many years, had an approximate life span of around 18 months before they were lost. So what did that mean? It meant that in a system where you have many users, you actually have to have processes in place for which objects are accounted for. Uh, and you may not be able to functionally account for small objects all the time. And so if you have small objects which have to be used by many people, you have to assume that sooner or later, those objects are going to be lost. And that's part of the law of entropy it's just the facts that human beings cannot keep track perfectly of all the small objects around them. And that was a very hard lesson, that uh, it was probably better to use disposable items than small metal items that were going to be thrown out. Now, unfortunately, we're doing the worst of both worlds in many institutions, and that is we are purchasing small metal disposable items, which are, are actually made of very high-grade metal. 
And anybody who has studied in the environment knows that there is nothing uh, as polluting as mining and processing of metals. And uh, that the throwing away of metals in the healthcare system is one of the greatest aberrations that we should uh, truly ban. So what I uh, got together with some of my colleagues uh, at, uh, in that CLSC, and we actually decided, you know, it was great working from inside of the institution, but we wanted to have a greater impact outside of the institution. And um, administrations being what they are, they were somewhat limited, limiting in what they were allowing us to do. So three of us got together and said, you know what, well, let's just found an organization. There's a lot of people who are calling us, asking us how to help them. So just because of the reputation that we developed from making a few small reports uh, and you know, doing a few um, interviews with newspapers and uh, television shows, um, we were able to generate enough interest such that we were becoming thought leaders uh, in this domain without ever getting you know, known on the internet or in social media. So this was just by word of mouth. And so we decided to um, take this on the road. And so we, we formed a nonprofit organization called Synergie Santé Environnement, which has as its mission to reduce the environmental impact of the Quebec healthcare system. And we have not looked back ever since. So since then, we have basically um, uh, rented out our services to uh, hospitals and uh, administrations across Quebec um, and work with them to achieve their goals of how they want to reduce their environmental impacts. So we're consultants. Um, I myself am a full-time physician, and so I don't have as much um, time to actually go on the ground in these hospitals to do all the, the heavy-duty uh, analysis work that my colleagues do. Um, but what I do is I meet with the administrations, and I let them know exactly how essential it is from a health perspective for them to actually get on board and get on board rapidly. And that um, along with my colleagues who have generated enormous amounts of data from many healthcare institutions across Quebec now, um, we can show pictures of what it is that uh, Quebec is doing and Quebec um, institutions are doing across Quebec. So for example, one of the, the earliest um, deficiencies that we discovered was that the government did not have any data as to what healthcare institutions were producing in terms of garbage. So we actually had to generate that data. So we had to go from institution to institution and actually figure out how much garbage was being generated by uh, the healthcare system. Uh, and thankfully, um, we discovered that most healthcare institutions, the administrations and their, um, and their various departments are actually really upset about the amount of waste that they're producing. And they really wanna help us out and try to get to the bottom of how to reduce this. And so what it turns out is that we're probably producing about 100,000 tons um, of non-medical waste and about 10,000 tons of biomedical waste every year. And that uh, Quebec generates somewhere between 10 to 13 uh, million tons of waste um, every year in terms of garbage. And in terms of cost, um, the cost of, of taking care of biomedical waste is about 10 times the cost of taking care of classic waste. So there's an enormous uh, incentive for us to actually tackle the economic uh, impact of biomedical waste in the healthcare system as it, as it takes up a very significant amount um, of the proportion of, um, of budget which is uh, allocated towards dealing with waste in healthcare institutions. So we've gone into, uh, you know, now um, over a hundred different institutions across Quebec and uh, of all different uh, sizes and shapes. And we're able to analyze and give you guys a portrait of what it is, uh, what kind of waste is generated by all the different types of um, waste, which are uh, all the different types of institutions which are out there. So whether it's from a CLSC or a long-term care institution uh, in com combination with a CLSC or a CLSC by itself, or sorry, a long-term care institution by itself or a hospital, you'll see that there's actually a wide variety of what um, their most important waste products are. For example, that hospitals make a, a, have a, a very uh, big challenge because a lot of their waste that they're generating, we don't yet have solutions for in terms of uh, buyers um, or in terms of recycling. 
So about a quarter of their waste, what we call, you know, basically end, end product waste, stuff that will have to actually be uh, sent to landfill. Uh, because we have not created a, a sector of society which is taking back that waste yet uh, in terms of um, the producers. Uh, and we haven't created a, a recycling system to actually pick them up. Similarly, um, hospitals generate enormous amount of plastics. So about 20% of their waste is plastic waste. And, this, and the, the good news is that the majority of this waste is actually very, very high quality and that if we can actually access that plastic waste, there's a lot of buyers on the market for it. So that's a very important element. Other elements that are, are really important that people didn't realize the uh, importance of was diapers. So diapers make up about 50% of all the waste in long-term care institutions. And we do not have a solution yet for what to do with these diapers. So there are several, uh, there were several projects that have happened over the last decade or two to look at reusable diapers. And for various reasons, most of them being suboptimal amount of investment, um, there hasn't been a really a, a, a top-notch success story yet in terms of um, how to reduce the environmental impact of uh, long-term care institution waste, particularly their diapers. So that is one of the, um, the next big challenges which everyone around the world is tackling now. So technologies are, are really being tested around the world on how to create you know, much more reusable diapers in, every, uh, in countries all around the world and whether they are uh, significantly um, acceptable by the population. So diapers is uh, one of those uh, elements that we are looking for solutions for very actively, uh, including various models which are trying to be tested around. However, when you look at the cost of diapers and the weight of diapers, um, it's a very interesting puzzle to try to piece together to try to find something which is economically reasonable as well as environmentally uh, pro um, um, satisfying. But a lot of these um, problems are actually economic problems which uh, have been imposed upon the healthcare system. And uh, one of the major challenges that we face is that our healthcare administrators actually don't really look at their environmental impacts so seriously because they're kind of being given, um, you know, a green card. They've been told, you guys are, you know, really essential service, so we're not going to look that closely at the environmental damage that you guys cause because you're really helping people and people really like you. Yeah, but we're actually killing a whole lot of people at the same time while we're doing this and that people maybe shouldn't like us quite so much because we can cause an enormous amount of damage if we're not careful. And similarly, if we do our jobs really well, and if we actually begin implementing policies from the top down as to how we um, take into account our societies and our um, patients and our community well-being at the same time as offering our services, we can probably multiply the beneficial impacts of being such a large institution in our culture. About one in every 10 jobs is a healthcare job. And that's a very big um, um, impact that you can have on your society if you influence those jobs to be more environmentally sustainable. So when we look about um, the hierarchy of what it is that we need to be doing in healthcare, is we need really be, need to be looking at what we call upstream solutions. That means we want to be looking at solutions which um, mean that nobody actually has to be thinking about it except for the people who are creating the objects and the services that we need to use. And that thereafter, there's a system already in place for them to really take back those objects uh, or to improve those services with, without us actually having to look at it. So in other words, to avoid us actually being involved in the process at all, is the most important part. In other words, putting the onus upon the producers, um, the suppliers of our products, to take back their products and to conserve the uh, environment themselves is the number one element. So if we actually, as healthcare institutions, decide that we're going to start demanding that our suppliers 
have environmental policies in place before we consider them, that is the holy grail, what we call environmentally preferred purchasing. And we can tighten up those policies as we go along. Currently, there is essentially no uh, healthcare institution which is really looking at the, uh, this um, very concretely and implemented it yet. We're starting to get some hints that some administrations are going to move forward on this, but it hasn't happened yet. And so this is one of the things that uh, us at Synergie Santé Environnement, we're waiting for who's gonna be the leader in environmentally preferred purchasing, because it looks like due to several restraints, such as having to work through a purchasing company, um, many healthcare institutions are sort of avoiding this up to date, but the technology is now making this simple enough that we're starting to see people stepping forward and considering it. I think there's a question. Yes, um, the question is from uh, Nisrin, and it is, were you able to get data on the biomed biochemical waste and capital items, environmental footprint in the Quebec's healthcare system? So um, we didn't actually do uh, the environmental uh, impact assessments that um, in the London Health Science Center has done. So we've done an enormous number of waste audits, but we have not gone into hospitals. They have not paid us yet to look again at their global environmental footprint. So that exercise was felt to have been done essentially for the industry. And what the... Um, administrations have been paying us to do is really to go in and to find what are the financially most viable changes they can make which are environmentally sustainable right now. So the short answer to your question is no, uh, because what they have been doing is taking the um, experience of um, Lionsgate Hospital as well as the London Health Science Center and other hospitals south of the border as being enough evidence that they should move forward on this. So um, they haven't asked us specifically to do those types of efforts, but what they have been doing is that every new hospital that you're seeing uh, being built now, or every new retrofit that you're seeing now, now has a team, um, thanks to the increased sensi um, sensitization of the healthcare industry in Quebec, um, in part due to the efforts of Synergie Santé Environnement, to take into account the environmental impacts. And so um, what healthcare institutions are really bad at doing is actually advertising the good things that they're doing for the environment. So you'd think that they would do a better job at greenwashing, but as you guys know, most healthcare institutions don't do a whole lot of um, publicity if it's not around fundraising. And fundraising tends to be much more effective around direct service that's provided to patients. So the environmental impact of the healthcare system is something which, for the most part, has gone um, little publicized in Quebec, even though we're seeing massive improvements uh, in the way in which Quebec institutions are looking at their energy generation. You know, we have multiple uh, healthcare uh, institutions now that have incorporated uh, geothermal energy into their energy mix. Um, with you know, massive improvements. They've all redone their HVAC systems to become highly e energy efficient systems. So you're seeing an enormous amount of investment of money uh, into the, the, the sectors which are going to save them money as well as help the environment. What we haven't seen them um, specifically um, ask for yet has been environmentally preferred purchasing of capital items. So we have not really succeeded at tackling the big prize yet here in Quebec. We're still in our infancy here in Quebec in terms of um, looking at what people are, are willing to do in the healthcare system with a, a very few um, really important exceptions. So we've just received our first contract um, to look at the design of a hospital uh, on the west end of the island um, for purposes of trying to design the most sustainable hospital in Canada, if not North America. So we're getting in at the very beginning, so at the design stage where it's really important. And this is the kind of project which is going to take about a decade, but which in the end is going to produce, uh, we hope, an institution which is going to have, you know, the environmental um, uh, 
uh, environmentally preferred purchasing as one of its top priorities. Um, and so we're really excited about that. All right, thank you. Uh, young question. Uh, what kind of leverage do health institutions have on the companies who make the products? Are there enough uh, alternatives on the market for hospitals to be able to choose the most uh, eco-friendly options? So um, there is, that, uh, there's, that's a multi-part uh, question. So to answer the first part, uh, physicians have a huge impact on um, the offer of products. So um, most companies which are providing the products are actually looking for physician input. So if you see that your, um, your institution has um, a particular company which they're purchasing their products from, you as a physician could actually contact that company directly uh, and ask about this particular product that you may be particularly irritated by or you're questioning and ask for the environmental specs and to say that you'd like to, to uh, ask for the most environmentally sustainable version of this product. So uh, as being uh, what we call top end consumers uh, of these products, physicians have the ability to give feedback to these institutions directly, and they do respond very, very quickly. This is one of the fields where it is not the industry which is the issue. In Canada, and also in the States and in other parts of, of the world, it is actually the demand. In other words, there has been no pressure from governments yet uh, onto healthcare institutions to reduce their environmental impact such that uh, right now we have, we had, I think for the first time last year, a letter sent from uh, the healthcare uh, minister to, um, which I believe was Minister McCann, to all of the heads of our uh, institutions, healthcare institutions, saying that they have to have a, um, a committee in, uh, in place in order to look at the environmental impacts that they're um, generating in their communities, but they have no hard endpoints. In other words, there is no um, metric yet that is in place that's been asked for by the Quebec government in order for healthcare institutions to measure their environmental impacts and even less any specific um, goal for them to attain. The moment they either offer a metric or a goal, the healthcare institutions are gonna be over it uh, they're going to be on top of it um, like, you know, like bees on, on honey. And so they really, really, really um, want to um, uh, participate in this process, but they have a hard time actually justifying it because of the fact that they have a lot of concrete mandates and environmental sustainability is not yet one of the mandates. It's still being driven forward by thought leaders like Synergy Santé Environnement and hopefully by medical students uh, and new physicians like yourselves. So um, as you can see, the other important element here is uh, what we frequently see being pushed heavily in healthcare institutions is in fact um, one of the least important elements, which is recycling. So recycling um, makes everybody feel much better because if they, they feel like it's all being put in the right place and, and people are very conscious of the fact that they are doing something and therefore generating something which makes them kind of feel better in an odd way. And then thinking that they're generating something which is going to help some. It's almost as if recycling in a way, psychologically kind of feels like a gift. It feels like we're giving a gift back to society that they're going to use again. The tragedy of this mentality is that in thinking your garbage is a gift to other people without knowing exactly who you're gifting it to and how they're going to use it is really um, a wish. And it's, it's a toxic wish because much of the recycling actually gets stuck not being recycled or, or being um, stored for uh, long uh, periods of time before they can actually be reused and are very much at the um, whim of the markets as to whether they actually get purchased again and how they get reused. Similarly, if you look at the environmental um, improvements which are caused by recycling, they're actually not so impressive unless you're talking about um, metals. The recycling of metal is something that we've known is essential for over a hundred years. Um, and certainly metals is, is really a crime to be thrown out. 
uh, because it causes so much environmental damage and toxicity uh, in its production um, that it really, there is no excuse for us to continue throwing out metals um, in any part of our society. And we have a follow-up question. Go right ahead. Um, to follow this question, who gives these companies their mandate exactly? So um, there are uh, hospitals um, actually designate their own, um, you know, um, quality um, standards uh, based upon their uh, different departments. So there are different departments base their standards usually upon government documents uh, or upon association documents of what the standards are of practice. So administrations are really dependent upon their content uh, specialists in their various departments to tell them what are the criteria which are necessary to be satisfied uh, according to their best standards. So there is a whole host of uh, organizations which are responsible for putting out the standards for these uh, various departments, whether you're talking about maintenance, whether you're talking about purchasing, um, whether you're talking about um, the various uh, colleges responsible for nursing, um, for um, orderlies, all of them have uh, documents um, describing the standards which have to be applied for worker safety, uh, as well as for um, the ways in which the uh, services have to be offered to the end user. In the end, you have a lot of safety requirements. You have uh, a lot of uh, you know, standard of care requirements. Um, and then finally, you have the economical constraints that the institutions have. So the institutions ultimately make the choices as to who they purchase from. Um, having said that, there is uh, at varying times in our political history pressure from our government to use what we call uh, group purchasing uh, companies. So no longer do institutions um, have the complete control over which company they're going to be buying from, but they actually have to go through a group purchasing company um, which uh, in, in Quebec, and there's several in Quebec. Um, I think there's now three that make purchases in bulk and that working with those group purchasing companies sometimes can be more effective uh, than working with the institutions themselves. Uh, at Synergie Santé Environnement, we were working with one group purchasing company um, for several years in order to um, improve the recycled uh, content of paper. And it's one of the reasons why now uh, across the entire healthcare system, you actually see recycled content in all of the photocopy paper, which is actually being produced there. So we, what we can do by working with our uh, uh, group purchasing companies is actually generate a market for these recycled materials, for in this case, paper, for example. Uh, or you can begin putting pressure on, um, on uh, companies to actually incorporate environmental standards and environmental impact assessments of their products, or even uh, more ideally to enforce their, um, their taking back of their product at the end of their life. So, you know, uh, extended producer responsibility is that holy grail that we want to be incorporated into contracts. The challenge is, is that contracts are many year contracts. So sometimes they're five years, sometimes they're 10 year contracts. So if you discover that you want to improve your environmental impact in, on a particular purchase, uh, which generates you know, many tons of waste every year, but you just signed your contract, you have to go about breaking your contract and then renegotiating it with environmental standards. Now that may just be what has to happen, but if that can be you know, passed as a law at the provincial level, that allows um, all of the uh, hospitals to break their contracts and incorporate environmental standards within them all that would uh, enormously facilitate things. So there is the direct purchasing power of the healthcare institutions themselves, which can be influenced by physicians putting pressure both on the, uh, uh, on the individual companies, but Sometimes it can be by putting it, uh, pressure directly upon the administration and saying, you know, this is something that you guys really have to look at. You have to start measuring the environmental impact of these products. And then finally, putting pressure upon the healthcare, the, um, the uh, 
Ministry of Health to actually mandate uh, better standards in terms of environmental performance for the healthcare sector uh, writ large. So what, what happens when uh, healthcare institutions decide to take this upon themselves? Well, they start looking around um, with the help of, uh, of friendly um, workers for solutions like this object, which you have on their screen in front of you, which is really a very simple piece of technology that was developed in South Korea several decades ago, which is basically, it's called the thermal dehydrator. And one of those elements of waste that we um, can go back for just here is if you look at the um, residue alimentaire uh, that is produced by our, our healthcare sector, it's quite significant both in, uh, in, in essentially all of the different sectors. So it, it ranges between you know 15 to almost 20 percent of all the waste which is being generated in our healthcare system is actually uh, food residues. And uh, it generates a very polluting waste um, and so multiple healthcare institutions are now looking at composting that waste, but composting has a lot of its own uh, problems associated with it. It can be, it, you know, there's a significant amount of liquid um, byproduct which has to be uh, dealt with thereafter. It can generate a lot of uh, insect issues. Uh, it generates a lot of, um, of odor issues. And so it, it's a continuous maintenance which is necessary to invest in our, our composters. Um, and regardless of which uh, many hospitals are moving forward and instituting. But it, just to say that it's, it's an element which takes a significant amount of planning to put in place. Unlike this particular piece of technology, which all it really does is you dump your food into it and it kind of heats it up and grinds it up over, slowly over a period of around 12 hours. And then what you get is sterile water out one tube and out the bottom, you basically get a fertilizer powder. Very simple piece of technology. It's currently uh, being piloted uh, in several institutions across Quebec, um, and the results are actually quite satisfactory. So it looks like this is one of the models which may be used um, by some institutions in the future to take uh, uh, to reduce all of their food waste, uh, essentially to fertilizer. And then what do you do with their fertilizer? So we had to figure out a solution there because this was a fertilizer which actually wasn't in the books uh, of Quebec. And so I know it sounds crazy, but every product which um, comes onto the market or that you actually generate uh, that de doesn't have a name yet um, because of the fact that it's produced in a, in, a, in a novel way has to actually be tested for its safety. And so we actually were, you know, uh, during our pilot phase with these, pro with these uh technologies were generating large quantities of this product without being having any legally uh, um, um, uh, any legal uh, way of disposing of it you know we couldn't even give it away because people weren't it was not uh, actually guaranteed to be safe coming from a healthcare institution so we actually got together with several universities including University of Montréal uh, and UCAM and did several studies uh, on these products with their agricultural departments uh, and tested sort of whether these were safe and whether they were truly uh, were effective fertilizers. And finally, after a couple of years, got data enough to uh, get the okay from Health Canada and from Quebec for uh, it to be given its own, um, you know, a serial number for uh, uh, as a pro as a fertilizer product. And now it can be given away safely or sold on the market as uh, healthcare institutions wish. Another piece of technology um, which um, we've um, uh, collaborated with healthcare institutions to uh, put in place is this, um, which is um, essentially a solution, one's potential solution to our biomedical waste um, issue. And that is that we generate enormous amount of biomedical waste and hazardous waste. And, it, uh, and the biomedical waste is one of those black boxes which has not been allowed to be analyzed until just a few years ago when we managed to have safe technology in order to open up those boxes and uh, actually measure exactly how many needles, uh, how many syringes, how many different sharps, and, and what, what was the actual volume of all of that and what was it composed of. And so now that we've been able to generate those kinds of reports for people, um, what they're most interested in is can we actually uh, avoid having to send those to expensive companies located thousands of, of kilometers away, which is what we do presently, 
we have outsourced all of the treatment um, of our, well, we've out, most of our institutions have outsourced the treatment of their biomedical waste, not all of them. Um, and that uh, after they actually treat their biomedical waste, it all goes back into landfill, which is may be of questionable uh, safety. So currently there, a lot of institutions are using steam um, in order to sterilize their biomedical waste. Um, and thereafter, they are uh, you essentially putting them into near surface facilities as, um, as burial sites. So one uh, of our uh, healthcare institutions to the north um, has uh, taken it upon themselves, along with our, with our aid, to actually purchase a, a piece of technology from uh, Sweden, which um, has been tested throughout Europe, which is basically a microwave uh, sterilizer for their biomedical waste. And this microwave sterilizer works extremely well at sterilizing under using electricity as the only input factor. Uh, and uh, thereafter, the sterile waste is then um, ground up and then basically turned into either standard waste, uh, which can be disposed of any way you want, or depending upon the contents of that biomedical waste, can actually be separated into uh, various materials, which can then be recycled or resold. And remember we were saying how important it was not to throw away metals? Well, now we can separate metals from plastics and various plastics using techniques which are commonly used in industry today. So I kind of just wanted you to, to watch um, a short video, um, if you don't mind, where we can um, just see uh, the, the experience and, um, and get a little bit of a taste of how it was for the individuals working um, on putting this project together. So this uh, project was done in St. Jérôme. Um, and what's important is that it's not just going to service the St. Jérôme Hospital, but all the institutions around it. Um, Dr. Zigbee, I, I think we don't see the, the video. So you don't see the video yet? Let us take a look and see. Um, so it says that we are still sharing at the moment. Uh, yeah, you just have to change the options when you uh, share screen. You have to to check the. Can you see my screen screens. right now? We can see your PowerPoint, uh, but if the video is on a different screen, you have to uh, you have to click on the share screen Sophie, button. Sophie, Julia, do you guys uh, see my screen at the moment? Yeah, yes. I see your screen. I think you just have to change uh, the the screen you're sharing. So you we. Right now, you're sharing your PowerPoint. But we, uh, you have to authorize us to see the, the, the video, which is on a different page. I don't yeah. know if you uh, can understand what I mean. So I can't hear you guys. Oh. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, I can't hear you guys. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So um, perhaps um, if you guys can still hear me, I will continue with the presentation. Uh, and because I'm still getting your um, I'm going to try to reconnect here. Mm 
maintenant, on peut le voir, euh, la vidéo. Can you guys hear the presentation now? Yes, we can. On part dans un tout nouveau processus qui, au lieu d'être traité à la vapeur, ça va être traité par micro-ondes. On va créer une charpie de déchets biomédicaux qui va, être, qui va tomber dans une liste sans fin qui va se faire désinfecter par micro-ondes. Et par micro-ondes, on a moins besoin d'une haute température pour que la charpie, déjà, elle est pas mal plus petite et qu'on s'entraîne dans une liste sans fin. Donc, et on a besoin d'une moins grande température, et ce qui fait que ça ne devient pas un gros amalgame fondu de matière à la fin du processus. Ça devient une charpie désinfectée de déchets qui viennent des déchets courants comme n'importe lesquels. Got the sun out there. Great. Bien sûr, écologique d'une part, mais économique d'autre part, euh, euh, vouloir traiter eux-mêmes les déchets qu'ils génèrent au sein de leur, de leur établissement euh, pour être totalement autonome et donc euh, sauver euh, des coûts assez importants euh, à la fin de l'année. Donc en fait, la technologie éco-stérile, euh, comme je l'ai dit euh, sur base des recherches qui, a, qui ont été faites, est une technologie qui, qui va utiliser les microbes euh, pour euh, chauffer le déchet et donc euh, euh, permettre une décontamination, on va parler de désinfection euh, du déchet et donc le rendre inerte. Donc qu'est-ce qu'on fait On fait d'un déchet dangereux, volumineux, un déchet réduit de volume de 80%, donc broyé et euh, totalement inerte, donc qui va être assimilable à un déchet ménager et qui va pouvoir suivre la filière des déchets, euh, des déchets ménagers euh, classiques. Donc en fait, euh, euh, à l'inverse de l'incinération qui brûle, à l'inverse des autoclaves qui utilisent, comme je l'ai dit, beaucoup d'eau, euh, de vapeur d'eau pour traiter les déchets, qui doivent traiter l'eau après, qui utilisent beaucoup de gaz et d'électricité, la technologie écostérine ne va utiliser que de l'électricité. Donc, euh, dans ce cas-ci, les machines sont directement connectées sur le réseau électrique pour fonctionner et n'ont besoin que d'électricité. Donc, pas, pas d'eau, pas de, pas de rejet. C'est un système fermé qui, en fait, euh, va fonctionner en continu. Donc, on, on est... On est euh, on se différencie des, des patchs où il faut charger, attendre euh, un cycle et puis après décharger qui implique beaucoup de manipulation et donc la manipulation d'un déchet dangereux c'est quelque chose qu'on souhaite éviter. Donc on est sur un système continu avec un chargement euh, continu de déchets euh, dans nos machines où le déchet va être premièrement broyé, broyé avec un broyeur très puissant quatre axes qui aura pour objectif de réduire le volume dans un premier temps. C'est un système fermé, je le rappelle, donc de réduire le volume de 80% pour en faire un, un, un un déchet inférieur à 20 à 30 mm, donc c'est un déchet comme ceci qui va, qui va réussir à totalement broyer et méconnaissable. Rapidement, nous ça, ça fonctionne comme un micro de la maison, où les déchets vont monter en température rapidement et après être maintenus durant une heure par des résistances électriques pour assurer une désinfection complète du déchet et rendre le déchet complètement inerte et donc assimilable à un déchet ménager à la sortie, totalement inoffensif, pouvant suivre la filière des déchets, des déchets classiques. La direction a embarqué en toute confiance dans ce projet-là. Enfin, C'est un projet qui nous amène à, à nous positionner sur le côté environnemental. La santé et sécurité des employés est également une, une priorité pour l'organisation. À chaque fois, déjà, dès la première approche, était directement emballé, juste par toutes les ramifications que ça avait. Puisque déjà, le fait d'être dans un projet qui va vraiment qui, qui va amener une autre avenue de développement durable dans notre organisation, déjà, juste ça, ça leur faisait plaisir. Mais c'est qu'on allait même au-delà de ça. On était vraiment, même au, au niveau que ce soit de la mécanisation du processus, donc diminuer les risques d'accident de travail. Sébastien Duverger, chef de prévention, santé et sécurité au travail pour le CIS des Laurentides. Pour notre service, c'est très une super belle opportunité de réduire à, à la source les risques ergonomiques, en particulier euh, le pousser de tirer les chariots, donc les chariots en métal ou en métal, bah, considérant la température dans l'autoclave. Donc, était très, très, une contrainte excessive pour les employés dans les activités de pousser de tirer, surtout vu la fréquence au quotidien. Le transport aussi des charges, on, on transportait les, cha les sacs d'un chemin sac à un autre, avec des opérations de flexion et de tension de l'urachie qui, qui créent des, des postures contraignantes pour nos employés. Et encore une fois, la dernière opération qui va être automatisée dans ce processus-là, c'est aussi toutes les activités de de bascule dans le container à la fin du processus quand le, le, le jeune de la matière biomédicale a été autoclavé et il fallait la remettre dans un compacteur. Donc, toutes ces activités de manutention où on prenait sac par sac, qui sont lourds, pour toucher, tirer, tirer des chariots, sont complètement annulées. Donc euh, cette automatisation-là, pour nous, c'est euh, un gain énorme, mais aussi pour la santé du personnel. 
c'est certainement euh, diminuer les risques d'incidents accidents et euh, puis améliorer la santé et la sécurité de nos employés. C'est une priorité pour l'organisation. Euh, ça, c'est un, un, un atout majeur pour ce projet-là. Euh, un projet innovant avec une nouvelle technologie. Les premiers en Amérique du Nord à tester, euh, à acquérir cette, euh, cette technologie-là. C'est super intéressant d'être euh, les premiers à, à déployer cette technologie-là. Euh, il y a également l'aspect environnemental. Euh, C'est certain que l'organisation est en train de se positionner avec une politique de développement durable, avec une politique de gestion des matières résiduelles, et puis euh, acquérir une machine qui revalorise la matière euh, de la, des déchets biomédicaux. C'est vraiment euh, pour nous euh, un projet extrêmement ambitieux. C'est sûr que moi, ce qui m'interpelle le plus dans le projet, c'est que ça vient euh, regrouper plusieurs aspects des bonnes pratiques de gestion euh, pour l'organisation. Ça fait qu'on regroupait tellement de choses en un projet qui se voyait porteur pour notre direction et puis même pour notre, même pour notre coordination, pour notre direction, même pour l'organisation. C'était ça qui a enchanté tout le monde. C'est ça qui a fait en sorte qu'on est capable de chercher plusieurs acteurs de différentes directions pour essayer de monter un projet pour le 6 au complet. Donc, euh, euh, parce que oui, on a, on a des bons volet qui est plus local et ici, mais le, le projet va évidemment se refléter dans tout le 6 quand on va commencer à impliquer les différentes parties dans les collectivités des chefs de médicaux, dans l'ensemble du 6 de l'Aventine, en appropriant tous ceux des hôpitaux, différentes installations ouvertes de Cine de saint jean Là, oui. So uh, we'll just continue with the presentation. So um, what we were just witnessing there was, um, you know, how inspired that the administrations and many of the uh, individuals who are involved from the various departments, from the manutention departments, from the um, purchasing department, um, this is an example of a, a capital item that we were talking about before, which is really invested in trying to reduce how much the environmental impact is of uh, all the other items there. At the very beginning, we saw that there was actually you know, six other large um, uh, uh, autoclaves that were being uh, used throughout the institutions uh, in the uh, uh, Cis de Laurentide, which were all being used for the same product to try to sterilize their biomedical waste on site, which uh, is a very laudable type of uh, activity, but it generated an enormous amount, it uses up an enormous amount of energy and water. Um, and in the end, they were still stuck with, you know, a whole lot of sharps. And so we had to actually find a solution to that. And that's what this uh, uh, technology allowed them to do, uh, and which is going online as we speak. So What's really important is that we are starting really quite far down here at the bottom left on this uh, red transitioning to green line here, where we actually um, are, we have a lot of hospitals which are still very much depleting our environmental reserves and that we're trying to move them you know, along this line to try to reduce their environmental impact as we go along but we're still very close to the bottom here. We're just beginning to put a dent. And in, in, in countries like the, the US, you have institutions which are much closer to sort of reducing their environmental impact to, to almost a net zero in terms of their consumption because of the fact that they're giving so much back into their communities. Um, we have very inspiring examples of healthcare institutions which uh, due to the fact that they are now generating more electricity than they're actually consuming, that a lot of their waste, particularly their natural waste, is going back. Uh, their, their, both their human waste as well as their, uh, their food waste is going back onto the land. Um, and they're actually uh, investing enormous amounts in reforesting their land um, as opposed to just uh, continuously consuming and producing waste, they're uh, considering that their healthcare institution is actually an actor in trying to make sure that uh, ecosystems get regenerated, not just um, consuming. So we're working at many different angles simultaneously, and that's a very important thing. Um, 
But for us in, in Quebec, we're still very much on the bottom side where we're very much depleting resources uh, and we're looking to try to generate more interest in trying to get uh, us into more of the, the living buildings category where we do much less harm. And then eventually into the re regenerative design, which is like the project which I was telling you about before that we've been um, 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 asked to participate in, in trying to really look at all the different technologies around the world and which ones seem to be the most regenerative in terms of their design. So uh, for examples, um, not particularly regenerative, but just examples of how uh, different institutions are looking at how to reduce the environmental impact um, and how to reduce how much uh, we have to throw away in terms of disposables. Um, even during the, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, a lot of institutions are looking for ways to not have to throw away their N95 masks. And certainly uh, several different sterilization um, procedures have been developed, some of them which are very um, effective at, uh, at imp improving our environmental uh, impacts as well as, uh, by, as, well as avoiding uh, using toxic byproducts. Um, similarly, uh, we are now coming online with uh, a very exciting time. As many of you may be aware of, the uh, environmental impact of all of our anesthetic gas, as, as particularly high uh, greenhouse gas uh, emitters, um, is is one of the major concerns that we have as healthcare institutions. And. Uh, we're certainly uh, interested now with the idea that uh, our, one of the leading companies in anesthetic recovery called Blue Zone has now been given the green light to resell their recycled, in other words, captured um, anesthetic gases from their ORs to uh, back to the health institutions, meaning that they are now uh, going to be allowed, they've captured enormous amount of um, uh, of anesthetic gases which have been used during the OR, such as desflurane, and, but we're not allowed to actually sell it yet because of the fact that it was not given a DIN number, it was not considered to be safe yet until it was analyzed by Health Canada in terms of uh, its safety. But now it has basically been proven that they're able to capture this anesthetic gas as it comes out of people's bodies um, and uh, filter it, of course, of any potential byproducts uh, that may not be uh, healthy and uh, is now been proven to be safe for reuse. So we've now closed the chain and created a cycle, a, um, a closed loop for this particular product. So what about doctors? Finally, what about us? Really, uh, our job is to advocate for all of this, is to stay aware of the fact that while we're actually giving services, we have to learn about our place in the environment and how environmental and ecosystem services impacts our health. And as much as possible, advocate for metrics uh, in our healthcare institutions that we can actually look at and say and see how we're performing. So really our job right now is to join organizations which are putting pressure on um, healthcare institutions or individually as thought leaders put pressure upon our institutions uh, by contacting them and letting them know that you wanna be part of their environmental com uh, committee number one. Number two, that you actually want to help them um, pressure the government to actually create standards if the, your healthcare institution is not able to move on its own, uh, that you want to help generate standards uh, or at least uh, encourage the, the um, provincial government to create standards for uh, healthcare institutions to begin moving on this at large. So the organizations which I heavily recommend that you become part of is the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. There is a, a Quebec branch um, with um, a very dynamic um, uh, president and co-presidents who are working together on it. Um, Claudel um, may be part of this uh, talk as we speak. I don't know if you're out there, Claudel. Anyway, uh, shout out to you. If you're not, certainly, um, if you wish to become members of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, uh, or l'Association Québécoise des Médecins pour l'Environnement, um, you're more than welcome. And uh, making the first impact would be to actually contact your administration. Um, and that can be literally the CEO of your CIUS um, or the DSP. Um, and they would be very happy to hear uh, that you're interested in it and would probably uh, be interested in having you participate in their committees. So um, 
go on the website, join the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, and learn that we actually have enormous number of tools out there for you. So getting educated and, and uh, getting access uh, to tools like the Climate Change Toolkit for Health Professionals, which is basically, uh, and it's in French, uh, completely translated. So it's hundreds and hundreds of pages of really useful information on climate change and the impact uh, of climate change on health, as well as the uh, ways in which uh, the uh, healthcare system and other systems impact uh, climate change and basically arms you with everything that you need in order to convince administrations of the need to act and in what ways that they should start acting. Um, including all the, all the data that you could to satisfy your own curiosity um, in terms of the impact of climate change, um, the, uh, the, all the health risks that you want to uh, sensitize your healthcare um, administrations uh, to the fact. So it's broken down literally uh, using the uh, best Canadian data on uh, you know, city by city, um, uh, province by province impacts, for example, ex uh, for extreme heat. You can take a look and see sort of the both the uh, present as well as the near future and future expected um, projected number of, of heat days, for example, uh, that people are going to be submitted to extreme heat. Um, you can take a look at uh, the greenhouse gas emissions trends by sector in this uh, document as well, and, and to, to, in order to begin trying to look at what elements you want to actually begin impacting with your healthcare institution. So remember, as, as leaders um, of, uh, within an organization which has such a massive impact on your society as a healthcare uh, institution does, you will actually impact any one of these particular uh, um, um, sectors by changing the way in which the, in, the healthcare system interacts with it. So if you want to change the way in which ag agriculture is happening within your area, make, uh, uh, influencing the way in which your healthcare system is actually purchasing the uh, produce in your area will influence what is actually being grown there to some extent. So you, because of the fact that we, we buy so much food, that we uh, are responsible for so much transportation, that we actually uh, cause so much construction, we will influence the industries locally um, to a very significant extent, depending upon uh, what it is that we want to have done. Um, and similarly, we can, uh, we can begin looking at the very fast um, impacts of, uh, that, can be, that can be incurred um, when we try to improve things like air pollution. So COVID-19 has had one of those um, perverse effects on, uh, on health in the sense that by reducing the amount of transportation, which is happening, particularly air transportation, but also road transportation, we know that we're seeing improvements in air quality across the world. Is this going to translate into more or less um, of, a, of a benefit than, uh, than the harm which is caused by COVID uh, is yet to be seen? Um, but certainly at the, on the short uh, term, there is some uh, very significant benefit that we can actually measure to improving the air quality. And this evidence is going to be useful for us to, um, to try to curtail the amount of pollution which is produced by our healthcare systems in the future. And similarly, if you're working at a smaller level, uh, you can use tools like the Green Office Toolkit, which looks at different ways in which you can generate interest at reducing the environmental impact of smaller clinics uh, all across. And this too has been translated. And so, um, we can take a look and see, uh, you can use the Green Office Toolkit for physicians and managers to get you started and inspired on how do you can reduce the environmental impact of your clinic. So their takeaway is really, you have to ask your administration to form a Greener Sustainability Committee if it hasn't already, but more importantly, to really look at uh, a sustainability policy and metrics that your hospital is actually gonna be using. You can't stop bothering your administrators about the best cases. You have to show them that there are other people who are leading and that it's a tragedy that the healthcare institution that you're working in is not a leader already. And you definitely have to make sure that you do not stop. This is your future. And the more that you integrate sustainability principles into your healthcare practice, the more satisfied you and your workers are gonna be. Thank you guys very much for listening.
Merci beaucoup, euh, Dr. Zigli. J'espère que vous pouvez m'entendre. <rire> oui, I can hear you, Gagnère. Good, <rire> super. Euh, avant qu'on conclue, là, je veux juste euh, m'assurer avec tout le monde, euh, si vous avez d'autres questions, c'est le moment de les poser euh, via le chat ou même euh, vous pouvez parler. Là. Donc, s'il si, n'y euh, a pas d'autres questions... Euh, euh, moi, j'avais une question. Oui, <rire> vas-y, Anna. <rire> Euh, dans le fond, je me demandais, tantôt, quand vous avez parlé, je vais le, je vais le dire en français, mais vous pouvez répondre en anglais, il n'y a pas de problème. Mm. Um, quand, quand vous nous avez parlé de, des capital items, uh, qui était un des éléments les plus importants, là, euh, surtout euh, dans l'étude de Lionsgate uh, uh, Hospital, je me demandais, est-ce que c'est les métaux qui sont utilisés pour toutes ces grosses machines, uh, de, vous avez parlé entre autres de, de les, les IRM, les scans, est-ce que c'est ça qui a un si gros impact? C'est quoi exactement le, qui constitue cette partie de Capital Items? Alors, c'est vraiment une, une combinaison de facteurs. Le métal, c'est certainement un élément. Alors, le, le, la largeur de ces, de ces euh, produits, de ces machines, sont, sont un facteur. Mais le fait qu'ils euh, ont tellement de morceaux qui vont là-dedans, puis tellement de processus séparés qui sont euh, spécialisés pour, pour les mettre ensemble. Alors, euh, comme on sait, pour euh, générer un euh, une médicament en particulier, l'impact environnemental d'un médicament en particulier est directement lié à la nombre de processus individuels qu'il faut faire pour atteindre cette molécule finale. C'est la même chose pour les, les produits. Alors, si vous avez une, euh, une grande machine qui a 2000 morceaux, puis chaque morceau, il faut qu'il soit euh, euh, produit dans une, une façon très particulière, vous allez multiplier l'impact environnemental de votre produit. Euh, alors, euh, c'est une des façons que vous pouvez regarder. Alors, ce n'est pas juste euh, euh, dû au grand bloc de matériel qui est, qui est nécessaire, mais c'est en fait à cause du fait qu'une machine a besoin de 2000 morceaux très spécifiques qui sont produits dans des façons euh, partout dans le monde. Alors, euh, c'est surtout pour ça. Merci. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions, tout le monde? Euh, oui, moi j'ai une question. Euh, C'est un peu un follow-up sur la question qui vient juste d'être posée euh, par rapport à, au fait que les machines sont souvent composées de plusieurs pièces qui viennent de, un peu partout dans le monde. Est-ce que c'est réaliste de penser qu'un jour, par exemple, le Québec serait capable de fabriquer ses propres machines à partir d'entreprises de, de au Québec, puis comme ça, ça réduirait l'impact écologique? Euh, en partie, oui. Euh, c'est déjà fait, en fait. Euh, on a déjà... Euh, le marché est très, très, très sensible au, au stimulus. Alors, si le gouvernement donne un petit incitatif pour les compagnies de produire les, euh, les matériaux ici localement, euh, il y a quand même des avantages de le faire. Euh, alors, et puis si euh, on, on dit qu'on va seulement prendre les matériaux qui, euh, qui ont des standards euh, environnementaux euh, de, de le plus haut, puis généralement, ça veut dire qu'ils ont, ils ont été certifiés par une troisième partie. Euh, alors, s'il y a une tertiaire partie qui certifie les impacts environnementaux, alors souvent, nous, comme... Euh, euh, comme consultant, on ne peut pas aller dans les compagnies individuelles pour euh, euh, vérifier qu'ils traitent leur personnel comme il faut, qu'ils utilisent les matériels qu'ils disent qu'ils utilisent. Mais en fait, ça, c'est la, la responsabilité des troisièmes parties qui sont certifiées dans leur domaine. Alors, il y a plein de troisièmes parties de compagnies qui font spécifiquement ça, qui, sont, euh, qui, qui spécialisent euh, dans les, les façons de faire de cette euh, de, des compagnies divers, de, de secteurs divers, puis euh, comme euh, en électronique, par exemple. Euh, vous pouvez avoir une, troisième, une compagnie américaine qui vient et vérifie que votre compagnie québécoise euh, produit des matériaux euh, euh, dans une façon très, euh, euh, qui est la plus avantageuse pour l'environnement. Est-ce euh, que c'est euh, réaliste de, de penser que tous vos matériels vont, vont venir euh, de votre euh, localité? Euh, probablement pas. Euh, c'est vrai que nous, on est très riches en matériel, euh, on est très riches en mines, surtout dans le Nord, mais nos mines produisent énormément de pollution. 
Alors, qu'est-ce qui est essentiel? C'est vraiment de, de boucler la boucle et de, de, de réduire le nombre de fois qu'on a besoin de, de lancer dans le terre pour sortir des, des, des nouveaux matériels pour construire des, des, des produits qu'on on vient juste de jeter. Alors, on a vraiment besoin que tous les matériels qui ont été sortis de, notre, euh, de nos écosystèmes soient réutilisés au maximum. Euh, de tous nos déchets qui sont euh, dans nos centres d'enfouissement présentement sont repris, puis qu'on re, on, on retrouve des nouveaux mines dans nos euh, zones d'enfouissement. Euh, pour qu'on peut éviter, en fait, d'aller chercher en continu, euh, continuellement des nouveaux euh, substances de, de, de la croûte de notre terre qui va éventuellement polluer nos écosystèmes. Alors, il faut absolument éviter les déchets. Alors, il faut organiser votre, votre boucle pour que le, vous, vous euh, créez... Vous, euh, vous sortez le déchet de, 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 de la façon euh, dont votre produit est, est fabriqué, euh, puis c'est déjà fait. Alors, il y a toute une façon de faire pour actuellement atteindre un but où vous êtes capable de défaire tous vos produits, euh, puis que vous pouvez les, les réutiliser ou euh, les retourner dans un cycle actuel euh, qui, est, qui est connu d'être fait déjà dans votre société. Alors, plutôt que de, de le lancer tous les matériaux dans une bac, puis d'espérer de, 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 de que ça va être réutilisé, comme on fait avec notre recyclage, il faut avoir un euh, but ultime euh, de votre produit à la fin de son vie actuelle pour le retourner en vie dans une autre façon ou de le réutiliser les produits euh, pour réinventer un autre produit par la même compagnie. Alors ça, c'est le but euh, qui est très faisable, mais ça prend euh, tout simplement un momentum politique pour le faire. Les, les, les industries ont déjà fait la preuve que c'est faisable s'ils si sont donnés un incentif, euh, un incentif euh, financier pour le faire. Merci pour la réponse, c'est très intéressant. Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions qui m'ont euh, ben, dans le cadre de la pandémie actuelle, est-ce que vous pensez que c'est faisable que les administrations ils soient capables de continuer de faire des efforts euh, environnementaux dans cette situation-là? Je pense notamment au fait de se procurer euh, tout ce qui est masque, jaquette euh, surtout. Euh, Puis, il y, y a comme l'option, de, disons, pour les jaquettes, d'avoir des jaquettes qui sont réutilisables, mais ça coûte plus cher. Donc, est-ce que vous pensez qu'il y a quelque chose? Est-ce que le fait que ce soit une pandémie en ce moment, ça peut peut leur permettre de peut-être prendre la voie facile de justifier qu'il faut agir rapidement, avoir le moins cher possible, donc on va prendre des options qui sont peut-être moins écologiques, moins durables à long terme ou qui devraient être capables plutôt de, de continuer ces efforts-là malgré la pandémie. Alors, euh, c'est une très bonne question. Alors, c'est certain qu'au début de la pandémie, euh, cette risque est très réel. Le, le, le fait que quelque chose est nouveau prend toute l'attention. Mais le moment que maintenant, ça fait deux mois qu'on est là-dedans, euh, on est, vous comme étudiant, vous, vous demandez les questions de moi, puis c'est certain que vous, vous pouvez demander la question directement à votre administration. Votre administration est, est, est toujours sous le stress du pandémie présentement, mais ils sont aussi sous le stress de retourner au travail comme d'habitude en même temps. Puis ce travail d'habitude, c'est de regarder leur impact environnemental aussi. Ça veut dire que le travail euh, de jour à jour, c'est vraiment euh, influencé par les pressions des, euh, de les, les gens comme vous. Alors, si vous continuez de mettre la pression sur les administrateurs, même s'ils aimeraient avoir une excuse pour ne pas faire quelque chose, ils sentent la pression. Alors, toutes les directions continuent à mettre la pression sur, la, euh, sur euh, leur administrateur pour plusieurs raisons. Euh, S'ils ne sont pas satisfaits dans leurs conditions de travail, ils charlent là-dessus. S'ils si pensent qu'ils ne sont pas payés suffisamment, ils charlent là-dessus. S'ils si pensent qu'ils font un mauvais travail ou l'administration fait un mauvais travail, ils vont, ils vont charler aussi. Alors, c'est notre responsabilité de, de euh, prendre l'attention la, de nos administrations et de charler aussi fort nécessaire pour dire, écoute, oui, c'est certain qu'on va travailler avec vous sur le, sur le coronavirus, mais la pandémie n'est pas le seul euh, projet euh, dans le monde, puis c'est essentiel qu'on n'oublie pas, puis on veut s'asseoir très bientôt 
pour parler là-dessus ou au moins, on veut, si vous n'avez pas le temps de le faire, donne-nous le dossier puis on va le faire avec vous. Alors, ils, ils ont besoin de savoir que vous êtes sérieux dans cette euh, démarche, que vous n'êtes pas là juste pour euh, le demander de faire plus de travail, mais de, de, de dire, écoute, euh, on sait que vous faites un travail très important présentement et nous, on va, on va vous aider là-dedans, mais en même temps, il faut qu'on travaille sur le dossier qui est le plus important, ça veut dire le, le développement durable de notre système de santé. Alors, si ça, ça va aider personne, si on continue à détruire notre environnement, puis finalement, on, on, euh, on perd tout ce qu'on a travaillé pour garantir avec les efforts euh, qu'on fait pour la pandémie. Merci beaucoup. Ça me fait plaisir. Hi, Dr. Zigby. Uh, I have a kind of a follow-up question that's just been uh, asked. Um, so, we've just been, with the pandemic, we've just been hearing a lot about um, how, like, the positive kind of impacts on environment with regards to like pollution decreasing, um, just articles coming out online uh, and in the newspaper all around the world. So, I was wondering if you think that um, this would be. Uh, And it would enhance and put more pressure on governments in different countries to enhance their actions in terms of climate change and and the projects they have uh, to become further sustainable. So we are. Um, what's really important is that we are training to be physicians, and so we're training to be people who are reducing illness. Um, so a pandemic should always be held up as the worst case scenario that you're trying to avoid in order to improve your environmental impact. So this sh the, a pandemic should be, if, if anything, a warning to governments that in order to, to reduce environmental impacts, there's many ways to do it. And the way that you don't want to have to do it when the time comes is to stop your, your entire uh, economy from doing so because there's massive health impacts to it. There is the possibility of direct life lost. Um, there is enormous amount of unemployment, which is occurring right now. There's, a, there's the possibility of being an enormous amount of starvation, particularly in African countries and South Asian countries, which are being forced to socially distant, distance themselves and which we are worried are not going to be able to do both pandemic um, uh, recovery or pandemic protection as well as deal with the increased stress of climate change on their uh, agricultural areas. So we're facing a real um, crisis uh, of healthcare right now uh, across the world, um, which is what we're going to see more and more of as climate change puts more stresses on us. Nobody wants to think about it because we're all thinking about Uh, the pandemic right now, but there is nothing to say that we're not going to be hit with another massive heat wave across Africa while they're trying to control their, uh, their pandemic response, or that we're going to be hit with more massive flooding um, in Central, in central um, um, uh, Europe right now, uh, simultaneous to dealing with pandemic responses. In fact, that is exactly what we have to plan for. We have to plan for the fact that we are going to have to deal with catastrophe after catastrophe, and sometimes several catastrophes together. Some of them are going to be global, like a pandemic, and many of them may be much more local, like the fires that we had in Western Canada. But they're going to be coming, and they're going to be coming faster. The good news is that we have a faster and faster response time, as you guys can tell uh, in the way in which we responded uh, with the pandemic. What is most impressive is how quickly society really can switch its behaviors on a dime using social media um, and really respond very quickly. The environmental benefits that we're seeing from uh, the pandemic uh, uh, economic slowdown is something that we see over and over again whenever there is a particular um, economic slowdown. And we've seen it multiple times from the 19, uh, we've started uh, uh, sort of measuring um, greenhouse gas emissions in the 1960s. And if you look at various different um, periods during, since the 1960s where there have been massive economic slowdown, like during the oil crisis of the 1970s, uh, during the uh, Asian financial uh, crisis around 2000, 
um, around the financial uh, meltdown of 2008, in each one of these situations, we saw a significant reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, improvements uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, um, in, uh, air quality, but all of those were short-lived because uh, we have an economic model which is still uh, majoritarily capitalist and consumptive in the way in which it functions, and we have to uncouple that. So um, while this is going to give us enormous data, which we have to use for how good it can get when we improve, uh, when we reduce our consumption in terms of environmental determinants, it's also a warning shot that this is the worst thing that you want to have to do to your society. Great, thank you. Donc, je ne sais pas s'il y a d'autres questions, interrompez-moi euh, si jamais il y en a, euh, tout le monde. Euh, mais, Dr. Zigby, euh, je voulais vous remercier euh, de nous avoir euh, donné de votre temps aujourd'hui. On sait que vous êtes probablement euh, super occupé là, avec, euh, justement, la pandémie. Euh, donc, euh, merci beaucoup. Puis, pour vrai, ben, de mon côté, j'ai trouvé ça super intéressant. J'imagine que tout le monde aussi, je pense que c'est quand même un sujet qui te sent bien, un peu comme vous l'avez dit, là, de plus en plus d'actualité, puis qui mérite vraiment qu'on y accorde de, de l'importance et de l'attention. Euh, je vais aussi dire merci à Chloé, en fait. Euh, Chloé euh, Mancini, qui est notre représentante euh, nationale là, en santé mondiale pour les FMSA à Québec. Puis, en fait, c'est elle qui nous a mis euh, en contact euh, avec ses conférenciers. Et merci à tout le monde aussi euh, d'avoir euh, assisté. J'espère que vous avez tous euh, appris quelque chose aujourd'hui et que vous avez apprécié euh, la conférence. Merci. Euh, Merci beaucoup. Puis j'espère que, que pour tout le monde d'essayer de, de, de regarder tous les événements de l'Association québécoise des médecins pour l'environnement. Et, et de, de, j'espère que vous allez euh, parler avec vos administrateurs et à votre gouvernement provincial pour les encourager de réduire l'impact environnemental de votre système de santé. Oui, tout à fait. C'est des objectifs à avoir dans le futur. Donc, euh, futur médecin et futur... Euh, justement, les personnes qui peuvent avoir un impact dans le système de santé et l'environnement. Merci vraiment beaucoup. Pour ce qui est de l'enregistrement, tout le monde, on va le... Bien, vous, j'imagine que ça vous concerne moins, mais juste au cas où vous vouliez avoir des détails par rapport à ça, on va le mettre sur le groupe Facebook. Puis, on va vous transmettre aussi un peu plus d'informations dès qu'on va en avoir pour ce qui est de la partie là, de Dr. Desrosiers. Et donc, super. Donc, merci encore, Dr. Zibi, puis tout le monde, je vous souhaite une bonne fin de journée. Merci, bye-bye. Uh, Dr. Zigby, uh, I'm sorry, I just had a quick question, um, if that's okay. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, so, when you say to contact um, our, our administrations, do you mean like a municipal, let's say? Like, can I just, like, what do you mean when you... Um, oh, uh... If you're learning, uh, if you guys are, have you guys entered the hospitals yet? And if you have, uh, you can look at your local hospital and contact the administration of your local hospital. So that means you can contact either their green committee. So you can ask if they have a sustainability committee. Uh, and if they don't, you simply ask to speak to their CEO. I know it sounds intimidating, but to say that uh, you let their CEO know that um, you are interested to speak to them about the environmental impact of their healthcare center. Um, and often their CEO, uh, if they do not answer you directly, they will direct you to um, their um, direction under which it's uh, taken into account. So sometimes that may be their public health director uh, who will answer you. Um, sometimes it may be under the uh, maintenance department that will answer you. Sometimes it'll be under their purchasing department that will answer you. Um, but there is a director who is responsible for setting up the uh, environmental sustainability committee within each of your uh, institutions. And if they haven't, it's a great thing for you to encourage them to do so, so that they, they know that that's on the mind of young doctors right now. Um, They're all looking at how to recruit people and looking at uh, the, the, the satisfaction of their physicians. And if they hear that young physicians are interested in the environmental impact of their health institutions, believe me, they keep it in the back of their minds. Great, thank you.